here on the Raptors Music and Food, I guess Hotline, although we are Zooming this week, Sarah Francis Hardy, children's book author, illustrator, painter, former lawyer too, we'll get into that a little bit uh, as well, but uh, you, you I, we kind of chuckled right before we started, first, probably your first time on a uh, on a sports show at this point, I would assume. <laughs> It is, it is. And um, I'm intrigued and honored to be asked. So I, I obviously I'm um, a, a fan of your books. Um, I have a four-year-old daughter, so we've uh, we've run through a lot of children's books at this point. We'll get into that a little bit. But um, I ran across your your mask up figures. You can see those on your Facebook page, different places. You've been you've been mailing them out. You tell me until they're gone. Um, but just different characters in, in the world we're in right now, everybody trying to find ways to relate and educate and entertain and do anything that they kind of typically would do in their craft during the, uh, the, the world we're in right now. So kind of tell us about it. What's, uh, what, 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 what brought the inspiration for your characters? And do you, do you kind of have one on you right now to show the camera as we're talking? I do. Let me, um, so these are the, I don't know if they're in reverse or you can see them, the characters. And then I've, um, I've done little individual decals that are reusable decals that you can put on your iPad or computer or phone. And uh, the reason I did them, I actually was getting ready for a writing conference that, of course, went online. And there was a big portfolio showcase. And since I'm an illustrator, I needed some new pieces. Mm -hmm. And so I just started drawing these little people with their masks and hand lettering the mask up words. And um, I would put them on social media and they were really popular. So if you want to see them, I'm at SF Hardy two on Instagram and Twitter. Um, and I've also got an SF Hardy illustration where I'm kind of double posting things and that's on Instagram, but it, it really just started. I, needed something new to draw and we were in the middle of trying desperately to get everybody to wear masks and so I um, made these little characters and I have to say the most fun part about the characters has been dressing them because I um, they're a diverse cast and they mm -hmm. tell a little bit of a story with their clothes one of the girls the first one I drew is this little girl with kind of a mad face and knees scratched up and band-aids and hands on her hips um you know kind of a uh, fierce little girl commanding people to wear their masks so anyway it's just it's been a really fun project but what i'm doing with the stickers i ordered a big bunch of them i'm telling people inbox me if um if they want one or two let me know what they want and i'm mailing them out and i'll mail them out until they're gone and all I ask is that you give a donation to a charity of your choice. So that's, that's been a fun project. I would assume it's kind of one of those blame it on your other day job kind of things. You almost kind of have a, like, story <laughs> off of them a little bit, don't you? Like you, you, you build these characters and you're, you're, you're like I said, you're dressing them and giving them skinned up knees and in your head, you have to be kind of going, okay, there's a plot here. It's somewhere that I can, I can formulate this thing out to. Totally, totally. And as a matter of fact, I keep looking at the whole cast and thinking, Hmm, you know that they 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 may have a story the whole the whole group um so yes definitely you you tell a story with those illustrations and and that's off in the jumping off place for a for a book this, this sounds crazy but i mean is a pandemic something that could be a subgenre of a children's book i mean is that is, is, like could there be something there with this this kind of thing there could be what what's interesting about the book world is that whatever i write today probably won't come out for a year, year and a half yeah. if, if I sold it today to yeah. a publisher. Um, so now that being said, there there have been some books kind of put out quickly, more informational books, like yeah, yeah, yeah. here's here's what you do. But um, if you want to read some pandemic books, I would suggest, you know, search out the young adult dystopian book world because there's there are all kind of, um, prophetic books out there, I would say. Um, so anyway, but it, I, it will be interesting. I will say as a creative person, um, watching what people are doing right now, watching the stories, the artwork and everything else that's been, that's come out of this and especially looking back on it in a few years will be 
quite a study of, of the culture of today. Is the, the, the publishing world, art world, or whatever, how has it kind of been impacted during this? I mean, everybody has to some extent from economic standpoints to just what they're doing day to day. I mean, what's, what's kind of your, 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 your situation been as far as what you see in your world? Um, things are tightening up for sure. Um, I'm, I'm lucky in that I have a really good agent and I'm going to listen to whatever she tells me to do. I'm doing revisions with her right now on a middle grade novel. So, um, I've been fortunate also to have that to work on as a, um, distraction is too light of a word, but, um, as, as just to have something else to focus on, I guess. But, um, yes, uh, Publishers are being more selective. Um, I'm worried about independent bookstores, so I would plug for, and especially in Mississippi, we have so many great independent bookstores, Square Books, Lemuria. Um, support your independent bookstores because we really, we need them. But a lot of my writer friends, of course, have canceled book tours and they're on Instagram and Zoom and doing things like that. So in a way it's opened up the the world of books to more people but but it's also a really scary time uh, yes. when people are not going in stores and buying books you, you, you mentioned middle-aged novel what what's sort of the the writing process for that because i mean you're trying to hit you know, a certain certain life points i mean a certain certain <laughs> language i mean you know because okay i went into children's books obviously because i want to talk about that a pretty good bit but we kind of understand at least what that kind of looks like and then you know mm -hmm. a, a novel for an adult what that looks like but when you get into the younger readers what is what's sort of that middle ground that you have to kind of do <laughs> mentally to get that done yeah it is it is tricky it's um Middle grade is tough. It's tough to write because you really have to get in the head of the way that age kid thinks. Um, and a misconception is that it's, I would say, dumbed down and it's the opposite of that because kids, especially that age, read smarter and they don't, they don't want to be preached to. Um, and they want an authentic voice. They want something authentic to their experience, not to a parent's experience. So I, I do feel like I am a little bit stuck in an 11, 12 year old head a lot of times and, and I like it. Um, but you do have to, I, I would say voice is the most important part, but as far as structuring the book, the plot and all of that kind of stuff. The rules are similar to writing for adults. Um, I wish I still had it up. I had a, a huge, I'm, I'm out in my studio right now, but I had a giant magnet board with probably 200 post-its on it where I was plotting out the story and moving things around. And um, it's definitely a similar process to writing any kind of, even a picture book, you do that kind of stuff. Whether it be what you just wrote from a, from a, from a, from a, from middle age or from, from that standpoint or from a children's book, do you, especially a children's book, I guess, I mean, you, do you know the ending at the beginning? I mean, we always talk about plots <laughs> and how people write like adult books, but what's sort of the process of getting from the beginning to the end of a children's book? Because, you know, I feel like in some ways there's a misconception because you, you think about, okay, what's well, just, it's writing and it's using this many words and it's short and it's whatever, but now you've got to write very tight because you've got to get uh -huh. all these things done in, a, in an attention span of a kid, right? Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, um, especially a picture book, but also those middle grade novels. I mean, if you think about your favorite, even your favorite novels when you were a kid, you read them over and over again. And picture books, you as a parent, I guess you know this, the favorite ones you were reading over and over and over again. And so it has to stand up to that. And, um, and you're right, the, the writing has to be incredibly tight. You have, in a picture book, you have usually less than 500 words. And you've got to write, you know, a full plot with fully realized characters and a conflict and all of that in that many words. And so it's especially tricky. Um, one of my favorite children's writers, Mem Fox, says that writing a children's book is like trying to write war and peace in haiku and that is what it feels like you know it's it just you feel like you know you just don't have the words to do this and so it's um yeah it's hard and it, it takes a lot of time in rereading 
your, your, your books to be it's, it's struck from, you know, in, empowerment, choosing your own path, that kind of thing. What, 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 what in your mind makes a good children's book? I mean, when, when you're, you know, there's all kinds. I mean, I've got, I can, I can go yeah. to the room and I, there's tons of stuff to choose from. But what, in your mind, what, what makes a successful children's book? I think the successful ones are... Um, and I don't necessarily mean financially. A, I mean strictly from a kid. Yeah, no, no, no yeah. Uh, when um, the, the ones you want to read over and over sure. again, that kind of book. And I think that happens when you, when you strike that balance between telling the story with the words and the pictures. So if you just read the text, maybe the text wouldn't quite make sense without the pictures and vice versa, where it's really a true interplay and and that also that's why the kid wants to read the book over and over again because they're figuring it out as you're reading or they're reading there's a little bit more going on cognitively when they're having to play between the words and the pictures and so i think that really makes for a successful book i will say um i love a funny book though um i really i, I do love a good funny read aloud book when you're when when you when you've written, you get three publications. Obviously, we'll talk about it. We'll put links in the description when we're done. Um, were, were you able to? I know your daughters were older, but maybe did you bounce stuff off kids? Like, how did you kind of run through these concepts to get these things all the way out as you're writing them? Um, yes, my kids are very good readers. As a matter of fact, my uh, middle daughter is an English major, so she actually just she was one of the people I had read my novel before I sent it back to my agent this last mm -hmm. time. But um, yes, I do. I, I bounce things off off my kids, and they were a lot younger when I started this. Um, but I also have a, a really good group of writer friends, and we send each other manuscripts and things like that, and and get feedback. Also, my my agent's very editorial, and I mean, I'll I'll work on something and send it to her, and she'll just say. Yeah, I don't get it. Let's put it in a drawer. <laughs> so, you know, that's what you do. That's that's part of it, though. Um, you really need you. You get in your head, especially with a with a picture book. You know, you're so close to it. You you really need a lot of eyes on it. How were you the doodler as a kid? I mean, are you you know <laughs> you're just writing on everything and and drawing or whatever? And kind of how did that how did that manifest in the you know, I, I, I know you ended up doing some other things for a little while, but how did how did sort of the art and the writing process go for you as a, as, as a young person? Um, yes, I my notebooks from when I was a child doodles all over little words in the margins. I found a notebook notebook from um, I think it was in college even and on in the margins were the beginnings of a picture book I was playing around with and I did have a really wonderful teacher in third grade, Miss Carter. Okay. And she really took me under her wing. I wrote a lot of little poems and I would write my, she, and she was very encouraging about everybody's creative writing, but I would write these poems and turn them in and she would hand it back to me and say, okay, I want you to draw it. And just with this, this constant, you know, draw it, draw it, write it, draw it, or I would draw a picture and she'd say, okay, write about it. And so I really think that was, um, I, I was already wired that way, but that little push put the seed in my mind at a pretty early age. What did it take, I mean, to go from that to, and like I said, you get, you end up in law school, you do that for a little <laughs> while, and then back in, in, into art. I mean, was it just a matter of, hey, I've got to find a way to pay the bills to allow me to write, too? I mean, what's, yes. where did you kind of go from <laughs> art to law to art, and kind of how did that work itself out? Yeah, the short answer is yes, I needed a way to pay the bills. Um, and I finished, you know, I finished with an art degree. I, I went to Davidson College, and I did a couple of summers at Parsons, uh, which is an art school. Mm -hmm. And um, I honestly, my, my dad just said, look, what are you going to do? Because that, that's going to be a hard life. And so he said, you know, if you'll, if you'll go to law school, you can do whatever you want to after that. And you can afford to, you can afford your paint and you can afford, you know, to have some time. So um, that, that's, that's what that was about. I will say when I came here to uh, law school at Ole Miss, I rented 
I, I found kind of a gross apartment, but it was two bedroom. And so I had a room to paint. And so I always protected my creative side. I always had had a space to paint or a space to write or, you know, dedicated space. So I never really let it go. As a matter of fact, in law school, I sold paintings through Southside Gallery on the square. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't something I let go of, but um, I, I was happy to be able to finally ditch the law career and focus on art and writing full time. When you get into Parsons, then you leave Parsons. I mean, what, what did you think you were going to do? Like, what was the hope when you got through <laughs> that to like, what, 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 what was going to come out of that? Or what was the end goal at that point? Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure. I was pretty young. And I, I think, um, I, I, you know, I, I would have loved to maybe work in a gallery for a while and then get an MFA in painting or do something like mm -hmm. that. But, um, you know, just my, my dad, I think was a little more practical. And, and as a parent, I get it. I'm not, you know, I'm not saying that was a bad decision. I loved law school. So, um, yeah, I think I, I thought I would, I always thought I was going to be an artist and a painter. I just was going to maybe take a little longer to get there. What, what kind of law were you, were, were, were you in? <laughs> what were you, what were you doing? Health, healthcare. Okay. Healthcare, so government regulations, it wasn't. Definitely super... not creative. Nothing. No, creative. no, <laughs> no. Yeah, I feel like everybody does that a little bit. I, I, I switched my major from journalism to political science for a semester, and I thought I was going to law school until I worked yeah. in the law office one summer. Yeah. Said, okay, that's it. I, I've been around it for three or four months, and that was like a, that was a, like a wrongful death litigation thing, and I'm like, yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm good. That is not something I have any interest in, and we switched back to journalism and started writing and doing some of that stuff, so yeah, it's... Yeah, uh, <laughs> there are a lot of former lawyers I'm, I, I've discovered. <laughs> But if, you know, but if you love it, you love it. And I did love law school. I will say, I just, I loved what I learned in law school. Have you always, is, is, is most of your, and, and I'm, I'm not an art person, so I apologize for any rudimentary thing that I say, but from a stylistic situation, I mean, it seems like a lot of your stuff is very vivid, a lot of colors, everything. Is that kind of how you've mm -hmm. always kind of done it? Is that, is that portrayed well to the children's books and the pictures books and, and different projects that you had? Because it does seem like that's, something that, you know, a little more lively, a little more vibrant, um, yeah. does stick out a little bit. Yeah, I've always just loved bright, bright, bright color. And um, I will say, though, switching from fine art to illustration was, was hard. I, I had to learn how to illustrate fine art. You don't have the story to rein you in. And you can, you know, you can paint a landscape and you know, if you need a tree at a certain place for the composition, you just stick it in there. Um, and you're just a little more free. And with children's illustrations, I had to tighten up a good bit. But not only that, I had to carry the narrative, 330 pages, the, the character who didn't, who do, the characters don't look like actual humans. They're sort of stylized, you know, big heads, little body, little people. You have to consistently draw them throughout the narrative. And I, I spent a good couple of years learning how to do that and how to, how to rein in some of the loosey-goosey um, freedom of my artwork to be able to stick to a narrative and tell a story. You can use examples of the the three that you have, or um, or, or just in general, because I'm just kind of curious. As I was I was reading up a little bit on um, Paint Me, Dress Me, and Puzzle to Pink again. I'll put the descriptions in in um, into the video afterwards. But was the inspiration? Hey, I know a story. Do I know a character? Do you do you kind of write and draw at the same time? Does one come before the other? How does that sort of work? Um, actually, I'm grabbing something off my bulletin sure. board. The, my first book, um, and you can see this little girl, I did this drawing um, and it, it was a doodle. I, I try to, I keep a big piece of paper out on my drawing desk, which is behind me and I'll just doodle while, before I start the day or even if somebody calls, I'm usually doodling while I'm talking to people and she was a doodle and I, 
looked at her and I thought, okay, I love her. <laughs> I just love this girl and I want to know her story. And so I started asking questions about her. You know, what is she like? What's she into? Um, I like asking questions of my characters just to come up with a story. Things like what's on her nightstand? You know, where would she go hide if she was mad or sad and things like that. And out of that, my first book developed. So that one for sure started with an illustration. Mm -hmm. Paint Me and Dress Me came about more from concept. Um, Paint Me was, you know, I wanted a, a story about creativity and color. Um, and then Dress Me was uh, kind, of this, kind of the same thing. I wanted a concept. I wanted a dress up book for girls, but I didn't want it to be completely tutus and sparkles. There's some of that in it, but I also wanted some careers and other things as, as part of that story. And all, all three of my books, my books, they come back to a, a message of be yourself and, mm -hmm. you know, about kind of coming together at the end and being who you are. When you finally get one published, when it, when, when, when it, when it <laughs> works, I mean, is there, is there something that was in that versus I'm assuming you probably had some rejections, other ideas oh, yeah. <laughs> and manuscripts that didn't come to, to, to fruition. Is, is there a certain amount of just luck to this or is there, are there things where you went, Hey, I hit some points here that maybe I hadn't done in the past. Um, yes, to both. And, and I, I'm a firm believer in that you can help create luck. And so I, uh, when I decided I was, I really, really wanted to be published as a children's book author illustrator, I had for years kind of halfway done it and send things out and gotten rejected. But I started um, a few years before Puzzled by Pink came out, I started going to children's writing conferences and going to, um, <laughs> spending a lot of time at Square Books Junior a lot of times, a lot of time at our public library here, which is, we have a great public library here in Oxford. A lot, but I spent a lot of time at those places, reading, reading, reading every children's book I could get my hands on. Um, I made it a point to meet people. I met other writers, formed critique groups. And so uh, by the time I was sending out puzzled by pink. And like you said, yes, there were rejections before that. I felt, I felt like I knew the industry. I felt like I knew a little better what I was doing. And I felt like I had, um, I had a grasp of, of what it took, you know, to get published. But all that to say, um, I, people think you have to have connections to be published. And I found my agent just emailing her my manuscript and showing her my website just with all the other thousands and thousands of people. Um, same thing with getting published. My agent, you know, sent my manuscript out to publishers. So um, I think you can create luck and put yourself in a position to, um, to get lucky but also sometimes luck has to do with timing. I do think Puzzle by Pink came out when there had been a, kind of a glut of pink girl books in the marketplace and maybe they, somebody was ready to see two sides of, of being a girl. And so um, I do think timing plays a part in it too. But everybody's journey is different. What, uh, what was the first manuscript you ever tried to get published? What did you do? What was it? Um, it was, um, it was a, a rhyming book about a little grumpy man. And I learned a lot doing it. I learned a lot about what not to do. I learned that if you're not good at doing rhyme, you really don't need to try it. Okay. And my illustrations for that book were a little too fine art. Okay. Um, but the biggest mistake that I made was that the book didn't have a child in it. It, it just really, it, it, you know, was about this old grumpy man. And there are a few books out there like that, but for the most part, you, you kind of need a, 
a kid and a children's book, you know, or at least animals. So a relatable um, character I, that the kids go, right. hey, that's, that's whatever. Right. I mean, and even if it's even if it's an animal, even if it's a llama or something, obviously with the llama books, but whatever, but just something yeah. that you kind of play off of. But it's a it's a child llama yeah. in the llama books, right? <laughs> but um but I learned a lot and and getting getting some feedback with that very first book was really helpful. I mean it stings. The rejections of course are just awful. But you kind of, you lick your wounds for a day or two, and then you really read what they're saying and you, you take that and use it for the next, for the next try. Do you ever retool some of those or have you ever, or do you just, uh, they go in the drawer and be thrown away? I mean, how does that sort of work? I mean, cause you have an idea, obviously you believed in it at one point. So what happened? Yeah. That's funny. You say that because that's one of the things during the pandemic, I have been cleaning out files on my computer and, you know, just physical manuscripts I printed up or whatever. And I, I do have a pile of ones that are kind of a, mm, maybe we'll take another look at that. Um, so, so yeah, I'm, I'm definitely at the point where I feel like I know more about writing and could maybe revisit some of those, especially the picture book ideas. Cause the ideas were good. It was just, I wasn't ready to execute them and they, I may not be still, but we'll see. We started this talking about the whole the whole mask project, but do you have any yeah. of those characters that we can pull the mask off and then turn that into something? I mean, is there, is there is there one or two characters that you have a little more attachment to out of those? Um, where is this guy? Yeah, I well, I love them all. I do love this little. I do love this little guy, my little mohawk guy. Yeah. Um, I don't. Know, I just think he's pretty cool, and I, I, I have um. I kind of think he could be in a scooter gang or something. So I don't know. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. I'm, I'm definitely playing around with, with where their stories could go. Do you want to stay in the, the, the middle grade genre? I mean, or do you want to kind of branch out in some of those other, you know, the other types of, of creative works? Um, I do love writing middle grade and picture books. I have attempted a young adult novel which is that's for teenagers mm -hmm. and the deeper i got into it the more i realized that that probably wasn't something i was going to be good at so um yeah right now i'm i'm hopeful about the middle grade we'll see and um i i, I definitely would like to do some more picture books the middle grade novel is illustrated though so it's um it's got illustrations throughout that are line drawings is there is is there a tone just maturity that is there that big of a change between a young adult and a middle grade? I mean, is that a mm -hmm. is, that, is that a more noticeable one than maybe I would think just 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 off the top of my head? Yes, it's it's um uh was, let's see one of the best descriptions I've heard about the difference between middle grade and young adult is that um in in middle grade the child is really trying to find their place in the in within the world and within the world that they're living mm -hmm. and with young adult your character is trying to stand out and push against the world um which is a simplification but it is a shift in the way the way you think um the way you think about it and the voice uh the voice for both is also really important. And I think voice is one of those things you're either good at or you're not. You can't, you can't fake it and you can't really teach somebody how to have the right voice for a teenager or the right voice for a middle grade kid. So um, I think that plays into it too. And, and, and I know you don't want to go like, you know, overly gender, gender specific with, with characters necessarily, but is there some of that too, where, you know, you're, you, you do a little better in the, in the mind of a, you know, a, a middle grade female versus a male or different things and just the way that the, the thought processes work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. I think so. So we, uh, we, we mentioned, I know you have a few left. If people are interested in your, uh, in, in your stickers and your decals, what's, uh, what's the process to potentially uh, get one? Um, if you follow me on Instagram, which is at SF Hardy two, then, um, you can inbox me and I'm going to put them up probably 
today, the ones I have, and I'll just, I'll mail them. I'll mail them to you, inbox me with your mailing address, and I would love it if you would give a donation to a charity of your choice. I, I love the pantry here in Oxford, the Oxford Lafayette Literacy Council or two that I've been suggesting if people ask me. Um, the other thing that's kind of fun about the people is that the city of Oxford is going to do some kind of public art project around them. I'm not 100% sure yet what it's gonna be, but we will see the little masked up people around Oxford somewhere. They might be on a bus stop or I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure where. They're, they're still figuring it out, but we haven't seen the last, the last of them, <laughs> which is really fun. Which, uh, which characters with the quickest? With people, what, 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 what were there, were there um, for a couple of them? The um, this little girl has been really popular. She's my little yoga girl, and um, I guess the first one I did, uh, she's kind of she's the scrappy one with the band aid. Yeah, but that, that that feels like the children's book to me. I see her and I'm in yeah. a, for some reason there's something about her that I go, okay, I, yeah. I, I see more of her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she's, she looks like she's about to take somebody out, which is just funny to me because she's in her little pink skirt, but her shirts untucked and all of that. And, and, and like you said too, um, at the beginning, you're, she's, she's a story. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, through her clothes and the way she's standing and everything else, um, she's a story. And you released you, you released a new character this week, right? Oh yeah, I did a suffragette. I did yeah. Um, yesterday for that hundredth anniversary. So I felt like I needed a suffragette. I um, I wanted to do a whole scene, and I just ran out of time. <laughs> ran out of time. So I, I'll, I'll do a little more with the suffragettes, I think. When did that, when, I guess, how long does this take? I mean, when you, when you create the first one, I mean, is that, what, what does that process look like to even get from start to finish? You know, it really takes a whole day to do one, one character, not, not a whole day, all day long. I, I'm drawing them on my iPad and I use a program called Procreate, which is fantastic. It's so easy to use and I've had a lot of fun with it. And that's, um, that's another thing that's been nice during the pandemic is that, especially while my family was here and we were all sitting around, that's, that was something I could sit and do while we were all sitting around watching a movie together or whatever. I could just sit there on my iPad and be drawing. Um, but yeah, they take, they take some time because I, I think I'm finished and then I decide to change the outfit or, you know, change the stance just a little bit. But, um, is the general idea in your head or are you just kind of doodling till it comes into, into, into focus? I mean, do you have some semblance of a, of a clue what you're drawing when you start? Yeah. I usually start with an, an idea of what I'm going to okay. do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so do we, can we expect more characters? What's uh, what, what, what's next? What, what, what do you, what do you got going? Um, yeah, definitely. I, I'll definitely keep churning them out. I need, what I need to be doing is um, doing some whole scenes. These, the ones I've been putting out are almost like little portraits, you mm -hmm. know, where they're facing you. So I need to be doing some, some scenes with these characters and have them actually doing some stuff and interacting with each other. Or, um, so that, that's, that's what'll come next. And, uh, it's great too because then I can build my portfolio and put some put some pieces out there, which I've been needing to do. But but in addition to that, I hope uh, I, I know that my agent is doing edits for my novel, so I should get that back pretty soon, and I'll dig back into that. And again, that's got illustrations, so I'll, I'll have a little bit of work to do on that too. Well, good luck. Uh, good luck with that. I appreciate you giving us a little uh, time today. And if that, uh, that yeah. helps you on the process, let's potentially do it again. Great. Thanks so much. Thank you. I appreciate it.